Hi everybody and welcome to today's Scientist in the Spotlight. So I am delighted to welcome Ilaria Michelozzi from University College London. We also have Roberto Spada with us from the Standard Biotools team who is going to be doing a quick introduction for you all as well. So just before I hand over, can I draw your attention to the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen? We're going to be doing the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to type questions here as we go along. Please use this box rather than the chat. So Roberto, I'm going to hand over to you now and you can get started. Perfect. Thank you very much, Holly. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And of course, thank you, Ilaria, for taking your time over to present your work. So I'm just going to be very briefly giving a small introduction into uh, what was previously known as Fluidime and is now known as uh, Standard Biotools, because as some of you may know, the company has actually recently uh, changed its name. But regardless of the fact that now Fluidime is known as Standard Biotools, I'm really here to give you a bit of an overview of the unique portfolio of uh, instrumentation that's actually available currently within uh, Standard Biotools, and more specifically on the uh, tool in the high dimensional cytometry space that Ilari has used for her specific uh, project. So as you might know, here at Standard Biotools, we actually have a uh, unique plethora of different instrumentation, ranging from things that allow you to do automated NGS library prep, high through qPCR applications, which for example, the Biomark X and the Juno. But what I'm really gonna be focusing on today is really on the, what we know as the CITOF portfolio. And here really what we have at our disposal is the capacity to now give researchers worldwide either in the form of its newest generation, the Cytof XT, access to an incredibly powerful and simplified way to perform high dimensional cytometry, or also in the realm of tissue imaging or spatial biology with the Hyperion Plus imaging system, the possibility really to do highly multiplex tissue imaging with incredible ease and again, simplicity. Because as I'll show you, and now I'm gonna be focusing more of course on the Cytof XT and of course what you can do in the realms of high dimensional cytometry, we really have, with Cypher technology, given uh, our researchers worldwide really this possibility of, again, being able to look at biological samples and now really analyze them with an incredible depth that was just not really possible to do with ease as it is capable of being done today. And now, here with the Cypher XT, which is now actually the fourth generation cytometer of the Cypher franchise. What users actually have in their hands is the possibility of using a very simple to use cytometer, which is incredibly high throughput because it really allows for uninterrupted 24 hours a day sample acquisition with an integrated carousel that actually even has automatic uh, decoding algorithms incorporated within it. And it's really simple to use. It really has minimal hands-on time. And as I'll show you later on, this together with everything that the Cytoff portfolio in the realms of uh, cytometry give you really simplifies the whole workflow all the way from panel design down to actually going in and acquiring samples. And so this happens really for a wide variety of different reasons. The first thing is that, of course, when we're talking about high dimensional cytometry and when we're doing this with Cytoff, the first biggest advantage that you have is the fact that you really now have at your disposal a technology which simplifies the creation of large panels. When you're thinking about cytometry, panel design is, of course, the most important thing to take into consideration. And what Cytoff does is that it really simplifies panel design because with the fact that in Cytoff, we're not using classical fluorescence dyes, but we're really using what you can think of as digital dyes, these metal isotopes, which really give very clean signals. You really now have the possibility to go in and pretty much mix and match all these different uh, antibodies or regions with their different markers and uh, uh, let's say readout markers, to really go in and create these huge panels of more than 30, 40, even 50 plus markers simultaneously. This of course also means that not only do you have a simplified panel design that doesn't have to go through all these incredibly iterative steps, but you can also then more importantly sometimes go in and validate this panel because now because of how the technology works, you can go in and waste less time and even less sample validating these panels because you can actually titrate dozens of markers in a single tube. And as I'll show you later on, I think Gilario will also talk about this, barcode all these samples into a single tube. And what this also means is that just because of how the technology works, you actually have reporters that are not your classical fluorochromes. So these are actually very stable reporters. They're not light or fixation sensitive. This means that it makes it very easy to be able to go in 
and look at, for example, intracellular uh, markers that can be found within a cell to look at, for example, signaling pathways, activation pathways, et cetera. But even more importantly for uh, some projects out there is the fact that now you can go in, stain a sample and actually freeze it down after it's been stained for you to go in and acquire the sample at another time point. And you can imagine how important this can be, especially when somebody is thinking about, for example, longitudinal studies that can happen at any given time. And then, as mentioned beforehand, now with uh, the Cytofix T, the newer generation of the Cytofix cytometers, you now also have at your disposal an instrument that really allows you to go in and perform hands-free 24 hours a day acquisition with little minimal uh, operator input. And then also something which is quite important is the fact that the data that is now coming out, especially of this fourth generation cytometer, is really ready to go in and be analyzed. And as I'll show you, we even have at our disposal ready to use softwares which give you analyzed data in less than five minutes after you just push the button after the data has come out of it. And so we're doing all of this with a wide variety of different regions. As I mentioned before, all of our regions are not tagged to classic four but they're tagged to what we consider to be these pretty much digital guides, which allow you to do these huge applications. And as mentioned, while we do have a wide variety of different kits uh, available, ready to use and to go in um, to use for your different projects, both for human and also for mouse research, we also have a, a quite an extensive catalog of ready to use uh, pre-conjugated antibodies. But one of the big advantages of psychotechnology is the fact that you can easily go in and label any antibody of your choice, as long as in a pure effect format, with the tag of your choice to go in and really modify and create the panels that you need to perform for your specific research projects. And I'll talk about this just in a second, how also with psychotechnology, you can really get sample multiplexing. So you can perform sample barcoding to really get incredibly high quality data. Just wanted to very briefly mention one of the powers of Cytoff is again, as I mentioned beforehand, panel design. And I think an easy way to see the power of what you can do with Cytoff technology is to look at some of the uh, ready to use kits that we have available. One such kit is called the Max Part Direct Immune Profiling System, which is pretty much a fax suit which contains within it 30 unique antibodies, each one tagged to a unique uh, reporter. All of these are actually dried down within this fax tube. And so all a researcher has to do is go in and take either 3 million PBMCs or even just 200 uh, microliters of whole blood, put them on top of, the, uh, of this antibody mixture within the fax tube. And then literally, this is a completely pre-validated kit. So there's no single stain controls to use, nothing like that. You're doing, you're performing that uh, stain. And by doing so, you can now go in and look at with this baseline panel, more than 37 immune cell populations. And literally you can do this with a software solution called the MaxBar Pathfitter Software Suite, which is made to be used together with this kit, which will go in in less than five minutes, give you ready analyzed data that you just have to go in and read again to be able to really understand what the biology, uh, or what the hidden biology is within your sample. And so as mentioned, this is actually pretty much kind of a backbone kit because here you have 30 uh, markers, which can identify these, these 37 new populations, but it's actually, actually just also now released at Cyto just a few days ago. You can go in and now add on top of this kit, ready to use, let's say, uh, expansion panels, which can go in and do things as, for example, look at activation pathways for intracellular markers like perforin, interleukin 17, interleukin 10. You can go and look at activation states, not only for T cells, but also for myeloid cells. You can also go in and look at, let's say, basic activation to measure the cytotoxic potential of T or NK cells. You can study the antigen-specific T cell responses. And all of this, again, with a pre-validated setup, which doesn't require you to waste your time in setting up these panels, or even, again, your sample in order to actually go in and do all of this. And so you can see how by using this kit in combination with this wide plethora of different expansion panels that we have available, and even combine them together, for example, combining the immune profiling assay together with our T cell panel, and then our basic activation panel, how you can really start to create these huge, incredibly informative panels with again, pretty much no validation or time spent on your end to actually go in and do all of this. And then very briefly, before I hand over to Daria, I just wanted to mention that another great advantage of cyber technology is the ease with which you can actually go in and barcode samples. Barcoding samples means that you can actually go in 
take multiple samples, barcode them, then pull them all together in one tube, and then actually acquire them all simultaneously. And you can actually do the staining either beforehand or after the samples have all been barcoded. And so by doing this, you're really improving data consistency because of course you're reducing sample to sample technical variation or any variation that's done, for example, in staining and uh, staining all these different uh, samples with these different antibody mixes. And you're really, of course, also increasing your workflow efficiencies because you're reducing cell loss, you're reducing uh, hands-on time on the machine itself, and you're really enabling scaled up experiments by doing so. And you can go in and do this with ready-to-use kits that we as standard buyers will sell, that allow you to go in and use fixed uh, cells, for example, with our uh, palladium barcoding kit, which allow you to pull up to 20 samples into one tube. You can do this, for example, for immune cells and do like a live cell CD45 based barcoding approach using CD45 antibodies that we as standard buyers will sell, which allow you to go in and barcode even more than 35 plus samples within the same tube itself. Or you can also do your own custom barcoding, which means that you can fundamentally, this is something that a lot of our users do, create your own barcoding strategy for the cell types or your samples of interest by tagging the different antibodies and regions with the metal tags of your choice specifically. And so you can really see how all of this together can really give you access to a technology which can give you an incredibly fast turnaround in order to give you the data that you need to expedite your experiments. Because with ready-to-use kits, which can analyze more than 30 markers, no ASCII-specific controls, the possibility of just putting all of these uh, samples inside, for example, a site of XT, which runs hands-free pretty much for the whole day, you can really see how all of this together with a ready-to-use data analysis package, how you can really get data in ways which I don't believe are capable to be uh, acquired with that speed with any other uh, approach. And to give you just a final example, and I think Elida will actually talk about this a bit more in her talk, about how, for example, this is actually already being used in the uh, CAR T-cell world. There was actually a very interesting paper that came out last year by the APHP in, uh, in Paris, in which uh, these researchers actually took that 30 marker backbone panel and actually added on top of it, the possibility of going in and looking at uh, CAR T antigen. And by doing this, they were capable of going in and actually performing the immune monitoring of CAR T and non CAR T immune cells after these patients were actually treated with Kimria. And so this is just giving you a bit of an idea of really the incredible amount of applications that can actually be uh, done by using this type of technology. But now I'm going to pass the, uh, the podium over to Laria, which is going to show you how you can not only use Cytop for the monitoring of patients, but even, let's say, for the upstream of the workflow and really to show you how Cytop can be used to gain more insights into the preclinical characteristics of CAR T cells. So with that, Ilaria, I want to thank you yet again for your time in coming over uh, today. And the floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation. And now I will share my screen. OK, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Ilaria Marina Michelozzi, postdoc in Dr. Giustacchini's lab at UCL ICH in London. In this webinar, I'm going to show how we applied mass cytometry to molecularly characterize CAR T cells. So first of all, uh, in uh, uh, this webinar, I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction to CAR T cells and their clinical application. Then I will specifically focus on uh, their molecular characterization, listing the main features we are interested in, and also talking about the technologies that are nowadays used for CAR T cell characterization. Then in the second part of uh, the um, webinar, I'm going to deeply describe our recently published protocol in which we use mass cytometry to perform a high dimensional functional phenotyping of preclinical human CAR T cells. Lastly, in the third part of this talk, I'm going to show how we applied mass cytometry and our protocol to molecularly characterize two different anti-CD19 CARs that are used in clinical trials. So chimeric antigen receptor, CAR T cells, are genetically engineered T cells that are uh, induced to express on their surface a chimeric antigen receptor, CAR. CAR is an artificial receptor, and in a simplistic way, it is formed by two portions. 
an extracellular portion here in green, which is uh, uh, able to recognize and bind the antigen and typically derives from monoclonal antibodies, and an intracellular portion here in blue, which contains several signaling domains that triggers CAR T cell activation and effector function. So CAR T cells are powerful therapeutic tools because they can combine in just one single product the antibody specificity with T cell cytotoxicity. Uh, in general, uh, CAR T cells are generated starting from uh, uh, T cells isolated from uh, peripheral blood leukapheresis of a patient, they are expanded in vitro and infused back into the patient. It is also possible to generate CAR T cells starting from allogenic sources such as uh, peripheral blood of healthy donors. Once infused in patient, CAR T cells are able to recognize and bind uh, the target antigen expressed on the surface of tumor cells. This binding leads to CAR T cell activation that triggers an intracellular signaling cascade involving uh, phosphoproteins and uh, nuclear transcription factor, resulting in T cell effector response. This response can be measured in terms of proliferation, cytokine production, cytotoxicity, and results in the apoptosis of the tumor cells. In clinic, uh, CAR T cells are mainly applied for the treatment of tumors, as you can see in this pie chart, especially of hematological tumors. And they have been extremely successful in the treatment of lymphoid malignancies. Indeed, so far, we have three different CAR T cell products licensed for the treatment of patients affected by lymphoid malignancies. When we are developing and designing a new car, it is extremely important to test several features and parameters that I here listed, and as we will, saw in, um, the, uh, we will see in the next slide, uh, they are associated with the clinical effectiveness of CAR T cells and can be predictive of CAR T cell effectiveness. So uh, we don't have only to focus our attention in the investigation of CAR expression and phenotype, so different subset uh, of uh, CAR T cells, but we have also to investigate activation markers and also the effector functions of CAR T cells, uh, such as their expansion, uh, their cytotoxicity, and also the cytokine production. It is also important to investigate exhaustion markers that are indicators of dysfunctional phenotype, and uh, uh, we have also to measure the persistence of uh, uh, CAR T cells once infused in vivo, because uh, of course a poor persistence can uh, uh, be linked uh, with a uh, uh, relapse of the disease. So as I said, some of these features are of clinical relevance. Um, indeed, uh, a successful CAR T cell therapy uh, have been associated with uh, a CAR T cell product with a high percentage of T cell memory, which are immature T cell, and also with uh, uh, highly proliferative CAR T cells. Uh, it is also important to test the cytokine polyfunctionality, uh, which is uh, an emerging feature of CAR T cells, and it has been associated with a good clinical response. Moreover, a good clinical response has also been linked uh, with uh, uh, persistence, long persistence of CAR T cells, and of course, the absence of uh, exhaustion markers. So uh, the gold standard for uh, basic CAR T cell characterization is flow cytometry. However, as we all know, this technology is limited by the uh, spectral overlap of the fluorophore uh, emission. And so, um, we can combine in just one single assay, in just one single tube, a limited number of antibodies. And so we can um, look into a limited number of markers. In here, I just listed three of the most recent protocols that uh, used uh, flow cytometry uh, for uh, immunophenotypic analysis of CAR T cells. And they, in general, used from 9 to 15 colors. Um, and uh, they were investigating CAR transduction, CAR T cell phenotype, activation, and cytotoxicity. But because of the limited number of uh, um, antibodies that we can pull together, uh, they were mainly focusing their uh, analysis on surface markers and cytokines. 
If you want to perform with this technology a deeper characterization of CAR T cells, you have to prepare multiple antibody mixes that, of course, is time consuming and it increases uh, the um, experimental um, complexity. Mass cytometry, as we all know, can overcome the limitations of flow cytometry, it is, and it is increasingly used uh, in uh, um, CAR T cell context. Uh, as Roberto mentioned, one of the first application of mass cytometry in the immunomonitoring of CAR T cell therapies is this paper published by Corno et al. last year, uh, where they um, notice a strong correlation between mass cytometry with routine flow cytometry assays for the measurement of the main subset of T cells. With this technology, we can increase the number of markers that we, that we can simultaneously detect in just one single assay. We can analyze more than 30 markers and uh, um, it can be applied for the investigation of CAR transduction, CAR T cell phenotype, activation, and cytotoxicity. But because of the huge amount of uh, markers that we can actually investigate, we don't have only to limit our analysis on uh, surface markers, but we can also perform with this technology a deeper characterization of CAR T cells, investigating their intracellular signaling, as we show in uh, our recently published protocol. So uh, in this protocol, uh, we uh, provided uh, a guide for CAR T cell generation and uh, functional phenotyping by using mass cytometry. Uh, in particular, uh, CAR T cells were generated uh, by lentivirally transducing uh, T cells enriched from the peripheral blood of healthy donors. These CAR T cells were cultured uh, without or with target cells in the unstimulated and stimulated conditions, respectively. Uh, the target cells are cells that are expressing on their surface the target antigen. In parallel, uh, we also use untransduced T cells as a control, and this control underwent the same experimental conditions as the uh, CAR T cells. Then we processed uh, our samples for mass cytometry analysis. Uh, in this slide, I'm going to um, ask you to focus your attention in, in two of the most important step of our uh, mass cytometry preparation, which is the palladium-based barcoding and the three-step staining procedure. Um, as uh, Roberto told us before, uh, the, uh, we use uh, this uh, barcoding system to be able to uniquely barcode all the different experimental conditions from the same donor into one uh, in um, all together. And then we pulled all these barcoded samples all together into one tube. So we ended up with just one tube per donor. This step is extremely important and allows us also to scale our analysis. Indeed, we used uh, mass cytometry and our um, protocol, and we successfully were able to analyze in just one single assay 90 experimental conditions from five donors. Uh, after uh, pooling all the barcoded samples, we can start performing the three-step staining procedure, where we are using antibodies against surface, cytoplasmic, phosphoprotein, and nuclear markers in order to have uh, deep characterization of CAR T cells. Specifically, we included in our panel uh, surface markers in order to recognize specifically T cells. And uh, um, we also were able to identify CAR T cells thanks to the inclusion of a marker which is able to, um, of an um, antibody, uh, which is anti-MCherry. And cherry is a fluorescent protein that is expressed by the reporter gene uh, present in the lentiviral construct used to transduce T cells. And so um, with uh, this marker, we were specifically able to identify in our uh, population the CAR T cells. And we also performed functional analysis investigating the production of cytokines. 
If you are performing a heterotopic culture, it is also possible to include in your uh, antibody panel uh, antibodies against surface marker expressed specifically on target cells, not only on defector cells. And so you can, be, uh, can monitor uh, in your uh, analysis both type of cells and investigate their downstream intracellular signaling. Indeed, we provide in here a vast um, number of markers that can be used. They are phosphoproteins and nuclear transcription factors that we use in our uh, intracellular uh, characterization of CAR T cells. So um, with mass cytometry, we were able to analyze 39 markers in just one single assay and uh, perform a deep characterization of CAR T cells, investigating CAR expression, their phenotype, their activation, proliferation, cytotoxicity, cytokine production, and intracellular signaling. So uh, mass cytometry is a very powerful tool for a comprehensive characterization of CAR T cells. Now, in the following slide, I'm going to uh, give you some example of application of mass cytometry and of our uh, protocol. Uh, so uh, mass cytometry can be used to identify CAR T cells and measure CAR transduction. Moreover, um, you can also specifically investigate a different subset of CAR T cells. And it is good to see um, that the proportion of these uh, subset of CAR T cells um, analyzed by flow cytometry and mass cytometry matched. Then with mass cytometry, you can also investigate CAR T cell activation. For instance, you can include in your uh, uh, panel of antibodies, antibodies against um, early, mid or late activation markers. And uh, in, uh, in here, I just reported a representative example um, investigating where we investigate the expression of CD25 uh, mid um, activation markers uh, of T cells. And uh, as you can see in here, upon uh, antigen stimulation, in light gray, you can see a shift, an increase in the expression of uh, this marker in a CAR T cell, but not in the untransduced uh, counterpart. But, uh, if you are interested in investigating the uh, proliferative potential of CAR T cells, you can use mass cytometry to perform a functional proliferative assay. Uh, we recommend the uh, use of uh, IDU um, as a preliminary step of treatment before proceeding with the barcoding of your samples. IDU is a timidine analog which is incorporated into the um, DNA of proliferating cells and uh, it can help you to specifically identify the proliferating CAR T cells in our case. So uh, the incorporation of uh, IDU uh, can be measured by mass cytometry alone, identifying the percentage of proliferating CAR T cells, but also in combination with cycling B1 uh, in order to uh, dissect the different phases of cell cycle. Then uh, mass cytometry can also be a um, useful, uh, useful tool to investigate CAR T cell cytotoxicity. Um, if you are performing aquaculture an heterotopic culture, you can monitor the uh, percentage of live target cells in your culture. Um, and uh, this can be a surrogate of CAR T cell killing potential. Moreover, you can also investigate the release, the production of effector cytokines, as reported in here, uh, granzyme B or perforin B. Lastly, um, with mass cytometry, we can also um, investigate uh, the effect of drug or inhibitors uh, on CAR T cell phenotype, functionality, and intracellular signaling. Um, we included this preliminary step of, of inhibitor treatment of our cells before uh, proceeding with the barcoding step. And in the next slide, I just give you an example of the application uh, of this procedure. So um, uh, upon antigen stimulation, we observed that a subset of our CAR T cells was actually expressing the CD19 antigen. 
normally CAR T cells do not express CD19. That this is the uh, target antigen expressed on the tumor cells that were recognized by our CAR T cells. So in literature, um, there is this phenomenon known uh, uh, trogocytosis, which is a phenomenon uh, according to which CAR T cells are able to extract from the membrane of tumor cells the target antigen, process it and express it on their surface. And uh, in a CAR T cell context, this phenomenon has been associated with fratricide killing. So uh, in our experiment, we wanted to know if these CD19 positive CAR T cells were actually trogocytic cells or were just uh, staining artifacts. So to do that, we uh, treated our uh, culture of CAR T cells with uh, um, latrunculine, which is an inhibitor of trogocytosis because it inhibits uh, the actin polymerization necessary for this phenomenon to happen. And as you can see in here, um, we observe that latrunculin A, uh, the treatment with latrunculin A was uh, actually able to induce a drastic decrease in the percentage of CD19 positive CAR T cells. Lastly, in the third part of this uh, presentation, I'm going to show how we applied mass cytometry uh, to molecularly characterize two different anti-CD19 CAR T cells. So um, Sara Gora et al. in 2019 uh, described an anti-CD19 low affinity CAR called CAT and they compare it with a high affinity one, FMC, which is normally used in clinic. Uh, these two cars are of second generation and they differ only in uh, the portion which is able to recognize and bind the uh, antigen. These two cars uh, differ for their affinity. And uh, uh, these two CAR T cells are able to recognize overlapping epitopes on CD19 uh, antigen and the variance in affinity between these two cars um, led to huge functional differences. Uh, indeed, preclinical studies and a phase one clinical trial CARPAL on high risk BLL patients reveal the superiority of CAT CAR T cells over FMC in terms of uh, anti tumor cytotoxicity and expansion. Moreover, CAT CAR T cells were also associated with longer persistence and safer profile once infused in patient. However, at this point, they did not know the molecular mechanism behind these preclinical and clinical differences. So to address this point, we generated CAR T cells expressing on the surface FMC or CAT CAR construct uh, from the peripheral blood of 20 healthy donors, and we use untransduced T cells as a control. These cells were then cultured alone in the stimulated condition or co-culture with target cells expressing the CD19 antigen on the surface in the stimulated condition. All these conditions were then analyzed at 24 hour post-antigen stimulation by fax and fax sorted for barker and sequencing. And in parallel, we also performed mycetometry on the same sample. So the main goal was to molecularly characterize at both gene and protein level, these two uh, CAR T cells trying to explain the functional differences previously observed. First of all, we performed a principal component analysis on RNA-seq and mass cytometry data, just to get a data set overview. As you can see uh, from both PCA plots, uh, samples were distributed according to a gradient driven by activation and proliferation markers. With untransduced T cells in gray shades on the right, and uh, stimulated CAR T cells on the left, with uh, unstimulated CAR T cells occupying intermediate position. Please focus your attention on the orange area, which represents unstimulated CAT CAR T cells that are closer to the stimulated CAR T cells and less overlapping to the untransduced T cells as compared to the light blue area, which represents the unstimulated FMC. CAR T cells, suggesting a pre-activated state of unstimulated CAT CAR T cells. 
So uh, to understand uh, this pre-activity state, uh, we focus our analysis on the unstimulated conditions. Differential gene expression analysis reveal that CAT, reported in orange as compared to FMC, in light blue, exhibited a higher uh, level of expression of genes involved in cytotoxicity and activation. And this molecular signature was confirmed at protein level by mass cytometry, as revealed by the higher expression in CAT as compared to FMC of um, cytotoxic cytokines, such as granzyme B and perforin B, and of activation markers, such as HLADR, CD25, phosphozap 70 which is a downstream effector of CD3 zeta chain, and phosphate 6 a downstream effector of mTOR1 pathway. So uh, to investigate uh, the, uh, if this uh, pre-activated state of CAT CAR T cells could affect uh, its uh, further activation uh, upon antigen stimulation, we set up co-culture uh, with CAR T cells and target cells. So uh, differential gene expression analysis uh, of this co-culture uh, revealed that CAT here in red as compared to FMC in blue exhibited an increased expression of genes involved in proliferation and activation in line with previous data. And this phenotype was confirmed at protein level by mass cytometry as revealed by the higher expression of activation markers and by the uh, higher uh, proliferation indicated by the increased expression in CAT as compared to FMC of phosphor B index of uh, proliferation is a marker of S phase. And uh, um, this proliferation was limited to the CD4 compartment. So we could confirm the higher proliferative potential of cat -CAR T cells observed in previous studies. Upon antigen stimulation, we were also interested in uh, investigating the differences between CAT and FMC in cytokine production. Firstly, we investigated their capability to produce single cytokines, as reported in here. We can see that CAT, uh, CAR T cells as compared to FMC, exhibited an increased um, capability uh, of produce effector and stimulatory cytokines. And then we focus our attention on the cytokine polyfunctionality. Uh, as I told you before, the polyfunctionality is uh, an emerging feature of CAR T cells, and it has been associated with uh, clinical outcome. The higher the polyfunctionality, the better is the clinical outcome of patients infused with these polyfunctional CAR T cells. Uh, as we can see in here, CAT CAR T cells not only uh, exp um, present a higher percentage of uh, polyfunctional CAR T cells, but they are also able to co-express more cytokines at a time as compared to the FMC counterpart. This higher cytokine polyfunctionality observed in CAT could be responsible for its higher uh, cytotoxicity that uh, was uh, reported in previous study. Um, we also performed um, unsupervised clustering analysis using a flosome algorithm on uh, mass cytometry data. We use the unstimulated conditions for this analysis. And uh, we observe that in the culture, even if it was unstimulated condition, there was the presence of residual B cells here indicated in purple and highlighted by the arrow. These cells were visible only in the untransduced condition because in the presence of CAR T cells, they were recognized and depleted from the culture. So uh, next we wanted to investigate the role of residual B cells in the functional differences observed between CAT and FMC. And so to investigate this, we generated CAT and FMC CAR T cells starting from CD19 depleted peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Upon CD19 depletion, mass cytometry data revealed that the um, pre-activated state of CAT CAR T cells was no longer detectable, and both CAR T cells were expressing equal level of cytotoxic and activation markers. Moreover, 
uh, the effect of CD19 depletion was also impacting the functionality of CAR T cells upon antigen stimulation. Indeed, upon CD19 depletion, uh, there is no longer a difference in terms of uh, activation and proliferation markers between CAT and FMC, and also the higher polyfunctionality that we observed in CAT uh, is no longer detectable, indicating that residual B cells are the driver of CAT CAR T cell priming. CAR T cell priming activation is a very hot topic nowadays. Uh, last year, two papers were published and they were uh, both highlighting the beneficial effect of CAR T cell priming on CAR T cell uh, effectiveness. And they were proposing two different mechanisms of CAR T cell priming. On one side, uh, the treatment of uh, CAR T cells with low dose of the cytopine, inducing an epigenetic reprogramming of these cells. And on the other side, uh, the antigen independent activation. Here we are proposing a third mechanism of uh, CAR T cell priming, the antigen dependent activation. So no matter which is the source or the cause of CAR T cell priming, Primed CAR T cells are on top of the hill with a very high anti-tumor potential, and they are far from the exhaustion valley with dysfunctional phenotype. So to conclude, unstimulated CAT CAR T cells are primed for activation due to residual B cells in the manufactured products. Upon CD19 stimulation, CAT CAR T cells display higher proliferation, more potent activation, and cytokine polyfunctionality. The removal of residual B cells in the manufactured products leveled the differences between CAT and FMC CAR T cells. So we can conclude that the antigen dependent CAR T cell priming is associated with the enhanced effectiveness of CAT CAR T cell products. I would like to thank my supervisors, Dr. Giustacchini and Professor Ambrolia and their team, our collaborators and uh, our funders, and thank you all for your attention. Happy to take any question. Thank you very, very much for that uh, the very nice presentation, very clear presentation, uh, Ilaria. So with that, I have seen already that there have been quite a few questions that have come in via the Q&A box no. and also via the chat. Just want to remind you all, if you do want to place in some questions, please do so via the Q&A box. <laughs> it makes it easier for us to be able to, to track them and, uh, <clears throat> and ask Ilaria these questions. So, uh, Ilaria, there have been, quite, as I mentioned, quite a few uh, nice questions, I think, that have come through during your presentation. And they're a mix between, let's say, the, the technical and the, um, and the application. So, I think there is one, I think it's, a, it's an interesting point, and I, I think it talks on uh, it, it hits the point that we were mentioning beforehand in regards to barcoding and so you mentioned that one of the very interesting things about this uh, technique is the fact that you can barcode different uh, donors from CAR T cells there was one question which I find interesting is that can you actually barcode different donor CAR T cells from different storage conditions by using for example alternative approaches like a CD45 barcoding approach or something like that is that something that you've done or tried well, we generated CAR T cells from uh, fr uh, fresh uh, unfractioned peripheral blood mononuclear cells, but you can uh, also uh, analyze by mass cytometry frozen samples. So there's no problem in this. And in terms of the um, barcoding, we actually use only the palladium based barcoding. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't think there is any issue in uh, using also the CD45, but I wouldn't mix the fresh and uh, frozen samples, but because, just because, you know, maybe you can have some artifacts and different level of expression after uh, towing the samples. And so if you compare it with um, freshly stained uh, <laughs> samples, maybe you can have some um, significant difference, but it's only due to technical and uh, yeah, uh, variability, so 
And so, and so you mentioned that you can actually go in and barcode up to uh, 90 conditions doing yes. these, this sort of approach. So is that something you've actually done? And how are you actually doing so in that case? Yes. Always using the Palladium approach? Yeah, 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 we did this. And um, yeah, as I show you in the slide, we are barcoding before staining our samples. Um, we, of course, tested that all our epitopes, the surface epitopes, were not sensitive to fixation and permeabilization. So this is something that you have to keep in mind if you want to um, fix and perm before uh, staining for uh, surface markers, you have to, um, to to investigate if they are resistant to this kind of uh, procedures. Otherwise, if not, you can uh, stain first and barcode after. This is another possibility. Or uh, use this um, fix and perm free uh, system, which is the CD45 uh, barcoding system. But and Sorry, sorry, continue. I didn't want to interrupt. So uh, we mm, normally we pull we we pull together conditions, experimental conditions per donor. So we are ending up with one tube per donor, and we are analyzing it at site of. Um, so all the conditions from the same donor will be analyzed at the same time in order to avoid, you know, uh, some technical artifacts and. Um, introduce more variability. We prefer to do by donor instead of uh, mixing uh, different donors and analyze you know, the same condition for all the donors. But you can actually modify this uh, according to your uh, experimental design and also your questions. So I think that leads well into another question that was actually asked beforehand. So here, here you mentioned that you have created this 39 marker panel that really looks at this plethora of different, uh, let's say, characteristics of the, the CAR T cells. So is this like a fixed panel that now you are applying for this project individually? Or do you modify it for specific other questions that you might have? Things along those lines. Um, you can modify it. For instance, if you are more interested in investigating memory subset of CAR T cells that are uh, really important and uh, predictive of their effectiveness in vivo, you can uh, um, include memory panel in it, and also you can investigate, for instance, exhaustion markers which as I told you before, they are indicative of uh, dysfunctional phenotype, and so they can uh, be investigated as well. So you can easily modify this, uh, this, um, the, the, the panel that we provided. And also you can modify, for instance, you if you are using a preclinical um, CAR T cells, if you are investigating CAR -T, uh, preclinical CAR T cells, uh, you uh, for sure have to include in your panel an antibody against the uh, fluorescent protein and the receptor gene no, to, to identify specifically CAR T cells. While if you are using a, a clinical uh, product, you can still adapt our protocol and use mass cytometry by, for instance, using the um, system as Corno et al. published, uh, in which you can specifically use an antibody against the CARS, uh, the receptor on the surface, instead of the reporter gene. So, yes. Okay. You, you can easily modify this, uh, this protocol uh, uh, as you wish, <laughs> because the mass cytometry help us in doing this, uh, in merging a lot of uh, markers and investigate uh, a huge amount of uh, proteins. So that's the beauty of this technology <laughs> and its applicability. Good to hear you say it. And so there, there was a question actually in regards to that, uh, more on the side of, okay, because you are looking at all these intracellular pathways, and that I think is what, what really makes, I would say, your, your approach so interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not just, let's say, a phenotypic characterization, but a functional characterization of okay. these cells. And so there's a few questions around, is the staining procedure for this a standard, like fix and perm, as you would do for plastic cytometers? Is there anything different? Mm -hmm. And a second part of that is, considering how all these steps can have an effect on some of the, let's say, uh, phospho, uh, let's say, markers that you're looking at. 
uh, at what time point do you fix your cells in order to look for, like, say, cytokine production or protein phosphorylation? Mm. Uh, okay, so, um, well, uh, according to the timing, we um, decided to uh, analyze our data 24 hours post antigen stimulation. But of course, you can, uh, um, it depends on the user request. Uh, if you are interested in more uh, um, metabolic and biochemical uh, changes, you can uh, uh, fix and stop your co culture, you know, some hours or even minutes after <laughs> the starting uh, of it. Or if you are more interested in exhaustion markers, you can also extend this co culture for uh, days, like four days, because it's when these uh, exhaustion markers are highly expressed and more detectable. So you can modify it according to um, your needs and requests. Um, regarding, yes, the um, uh, timing, um, normally we treat um, with brefeldin A our samples before starting the even the fixation. Just after the co-culture, 24 hour post co-culture, we start with this brefeldin A uh, treatment. Um, brefeldin A is an inhibitor of uh, the protein transport between the um, endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi. So it allows you to uh, in better detect intracellular uh, cytokines and avoid their release in the media. And we normally treat these uh, cells for four hours with Brefeldin A. And then if you're using as, uh, IDU uh, as well uh, for a proliferation um, uh, analysis, um, you have to, after let's say three hour and a half of a culture with Brefeldin A, you start the IDU treatment for 30 minutes. And then you wash your cells and start with the fixation, the very first step. Uh, that we perform in our analysis, in our um, uh, processing of uh, the samples for uh, mass cytometry. Uh, as I said, uh, we fix first and, uh, and barcode and then stain. That's why we are uh, modifying a little bit the uh, commercial protocol uh, that is provided. Um, but, but yes, it's something that you can uh, easily modify uh, again according to your uh, request. If you are not interested in cytokines, if you're not interested in a proliferation uh, and uh, you want just uh, to investigate surface markers that are actually uh, sensitive to fixation and permeabilization, you can start with staining first and then do the uh, post-staining barcoding. Um, and yes, and whatever. Okay, no, it's perfect. I think I think the, the important thing to, to mention is uh, really the fact that the all these steps which you're mentioning and which are crucial in order, of course, to go in and set up your panel. For anybody that's done, let's say, flow cytometry, a classical experiment for intercept, it's really the same thing. It's just a matter of timing where you want to do these different steps so that they can uh, go in and um, and uh, and work. And so uh, there was uh, another question here was mentioning, so you, you're doing all of the, so this panel, right? And you're applying it to these preclinical products, but are you actually, is your goal then to just use this as a discovery, let's say panel to just get an understanding of what's going on within CAR T cells, or are you specifically trying to identify a signature that can be used downstream either in a, a manufacturing process or even in a, your development process of a uh, of a CAR T cell. Yeah, for sure. Uh, our discoveries um, uh, in uh, our recently uh, prepared manuscripts available on BioArchive um, are highlighting a functional signature of CAR T cells uh, linked to. CAR -T, pri CAR T cell priming and polyfunctionality that can be easily investigated also in a different CAR T cell construct. So uh, our panel and uh, mass cytometry in general can be uh, usually uh, used for the characterization of CAR T cells. And um, once characterized, you can also test uh, the functionality of your CAR T cells according to the markers that we are uh, using. And you can see if there is a polyfunctional, huge polyfunctionality, it means that 
it is likely that it will be more effective in, uh, in vivo as compared to uh, CAR, but it, it doesn't show any polyfunctional uh, ability or also the uh, proliferation uh, and the activation markers as well. And also, well, yes, also including the phosphoproteins and all the intracellular signaling. Yeah. Oh, I, I also believe, and I really think that what uh, really uh, personally struck me of your uh, of your work is is the potential of really being able to do all these things in one go, yeah. without having to rely on a, a plethora of separate assays that are using. No, exactly. This is the great advantage of uh, using uh, mass cytometry in uh, in CAR T cell characterization because you can uh, build your uh, panel with a huge amount of uh, markers you are interested in and investigate all the different features that are really relevant in a complete and comprehensive characterization of CAR T cells in just one single go. So, yes. And in, in that regards, then, is there like a minimum number of uh, cells that you acquire per sample in order to, uh, you know, pick up the smallest population? I can imagine sometimes it could be the CAR-T population, depending, or a specific subset. Is, is there like a recommendation you would give to uh, anybody uh, that's starting off? Uh, I wouldn't uh, acquire less than uh, 100,000 cells, less than, yes, less than uh, 80,000 cells. Yeah. Okay. But it's something that can be easily scaled up then in terms of like sample uh, sample numbers. It's, it's not a very big amount, I would say. Uh, yeah, well, um, remember that I was analyzing a pooled bar of barcoded samples. So I'm talking about the conditions, all of the conditions from one donor. So all together, they, do not have, they have to exceed, let's say, 100,000. Okay. That's it. Oh, okay, well, in that case, I can about one condition, you know, <laughs> it's a yeah, yeah it's, it's a pool, but it's uh, easier to reach these numbers, and yeah, yeah. Uh, makes makes sense. And so, the, talking about conditions, there was one let's say more really application based uh, question on your you were you were mentioning beforehand, and so it's after removing the CD19 positive T cells. They were asking, did you try to actually add different amounts of uh, an antigen for those CAR T cells to see whether you can actually modulate the activation during the manufacturing process? That's something you've done to like do a uh, like a sort of titration, I would say, activation of the CAR T cells to see how they respond differently to these no, to these stimuli. Uh, we we haven't performed this. We actually uh, removed the CD19 B cells that were present in the culture. So uh, they were expressing the CD19 antigen, but they were a normal B cells present in the samples, the original samples that we used to produce CAR T cells. Uh, and we just remove them and compare it uh, with uh, the normal manufacturer protocol in order to see if their um, presence could have a role in the functional differences between CAR and FMC. So this was the main uh, question, let's say, of uh, our uh, experiment. But we didn't uh, analyze any further antigen uh, activation and exposure. So there's one question which maybe I, I can actually potentially answer to, and I think it, it is an important one, because especially here as we're talking about such an important, uh, let's say, application, such as CAR T cells, and it's how does one see Sartoff working in a more regulated environment in terms of validation uh, for our, some of these commercial kits that we have, interassay, interassay position, instrument to instrument reliability, et cetera. So I don't know, Ilad, if you want to comment on that, but what I can mention uh, is that for all those who are interested, we do actually have quite a lot of data which proves and really shows the robustness of the um, of the technology in of itself, but especially of some of these uh, pre-validated kits, because that's a question that we get a lot is, okay, these are very nicely validated kits, but how are they been validated? What is the intra-assay reproducibility, the intra-assay reproducibility, the site-to-site -site reproducibility, exactly all, all those questions. And we have some very nice uh, white papers which go into detail. And honestly, if you have any more questions, you can find a lot of that information on our website or don't hesitate in reaching out to your local fluid line uh, representative because we will be happy to give you some of that information. But I don't know, Ilaria, if this is something that you've also had any experience with it in terms of 
how reproducible it is for you to perform these experiments, uh, you know, in a longitudinal fashion, different batches, etc. Uh, do you have any comments yeah, you would like to make? Several experiments uh, with mathematometry, and uh, mm, they were all consistent. Uh, of course, uh, you mm, you can, uh, you know, uh, for instance, um, if you're planning to perform several experiments or uh, investigating the same uh, uh, features, you can prepare in advance a mixture of uh, antibodies, a cocktail of antibodies, and store it for longer, like, you know, in at minus 80 or liquid nitrogen, instead of preparing it freshly every time. And this will reduce, again, the batch effects and all the a technical variability that you can have. And also during the acquisition of your samples, yeah, you, uh, we normally include uh, the um, calibration bits, EQ bits, uh, that are um, important, of course, to monitor the performance of the instrument, but also they can guarantee you a comparability uh, inter-experiment. Um, so it's something that is good to <laughs> keep in mind. Uh, it's, it's, it's an important one. So I'm just conscious there are quite a few questions. I don't think we'll be able to go through all of them just because I'm conscious of time. We're here already at uh, five o'clock, but I think that that speaks uh, largely to uh, the interest that you've, uh, you've garnered uh, after this presentation. So uh, I would say there's one which is, an, I think, an important one, actually, and it's uh, saying this is an extraordinary panel, but how are you actually analyzing the data? Like, is there any sort of uh, software package, specific software package that you're using, a validated workflow? Yeah, so, uh, How is that being done? Yeah, so uh, generally, uh, well, uh, I start with the normal procedure of a normalization using EQBits and the barcoding uh, using uh, the um, site of software. Um, and then I uh, perform uh, uh, the cleaning of the data using ocean parameters and, uh, uh, for instance, the DNA content um, uh, using uh, the Cytobank software. And then you can proceed by, you know, investigating all the different subset of uh, your uh, population. You can proceed with manual getting strategy or with uh, computational uh, algorithm of a clustering analysis, as I told you before, FLOSOM. I use this um, uh, clustering, unsupervised clustering analysis that allowed us to uh, identify um, the different subset uh, in our population. So you can do computationally. And uh, one uh, another thing is that uh, if you're interested in comparing uh, different, uh, I don't know, car construct, different conditions, the expression of a marker in different uh, uh, samples, you can also use this um, uh, EMD score, which is the earth mover uh, distance, uh, which is a gold standard in the measurement of uh, the intensity of uh, markers by mass cytometry. It's also applied in uh, flow cytometry, but in this case, we are referring to uh, mass cytometry. And uh, uh, the great advantage is that this uh, score, it doesn't re uh, only take into account the amount of uh, cells that are expressed in that marker, but also the extent of expression of this marker. So it's a very complete um, score that you can use. And I actually use this in our um, manuscript about CAT and FMC comparison. Uh, we investigated and did all the comparison using this score. You can identify and set uh, you know, a control. You can use it uh, as a denominator, as a baseline. And uh, according to this, you can uh, investigate if there is an increase or a decrease of that particular marker in the conditions that you're interested in. And once again, it's very flexible and can be adapted to any kind of uh, analysis that you want to perform. Yeah. And uh, last thing, if, uh, if you want to perform a correlation analysis, uh, but stronger one, you can use DREMI uh, algorithm uh, that can give you an um, idea of the correlation between the different markers and identify some uh, association uh, that can be interested. And um, it, yeah, it has a great sensitivity. So maybe you can go for this approach <laughs> as well. 
So again, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time and I'm very sorry if I won't be able to, to get across all the, the questions, but uh, I, Ilaria, I wanted to, first of all, thank you yet again, very, very much for, for your time today. Again, I think uh, I've enjoyed personally this, this Q&A session a lot. There've been a lot of questions. I have not had the time to honestly go through uh, uh, all of them. I do want to, however, please remind everybody that if we have not been capable of uh, answering your questions, do not hesitate in writing out to us at marketingeurope at foodon.com. And we'll be happy to put you in contact with uh, Ilaria if these are questions. Yeah, that I will be uh, very happy to answer any question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much again for the invitation. No, thank you. Thank you, Ilaria. It's been, it's been a pleasure getting to, uh, to hear you talk about all your, your work. I really see a huge amount of uh, potential for how this can develop even further and really help the field. I think you, you've explained wonderfully uh, where this, this, uh, this approach can go, really standardizing and I think making life easier for other people which are going in and really trying to understand uh, how better and best to use uh, all these, let's say, cellular immunotherapies that can hopefully really revolutionize the uh, immunotherapy market in place. So with that, again, I want to thank you again for your time, Ilaria, and thank you all for uh, having been here today at this uh, Standard BioTools uh, webinar. And I do hope to have a chance to meet you all in person at a, an event live. It will be the case for you, Ilaria, in just two days. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, I wish you all a great day. And uh, again, thank you very much for your time. All the best. Thank you. Thank you again.